welcome to the Nutrition Burnout Podcast, your home for food and body obsession. I'm your host, Christy Brown, founder and creator of Intuitively Strong. Hello, hello, my friends, and welcome to the Nutrition Burnout Podcast. I'm so happy that you're here. Because today, as I promised my Sunday Scaries email list, my fam, my core group there, uh, and if you're not on the list, there is a link in the bio to get on my Sunday Scaries, which is weekly binge eating help or help to help you overcome emotional eating, stress eating, anxiety eating, boredom eating, which is exactly what we're going to talk about today. And this was brought on by one of my best friends. Uh, I was actually checking in with her and she's actually a pretty intuitive eater. She is somebody who, um, when I was macro counting and deep into that, we kind of did that together too. And now it's, (laughs) she sent me a text and I'm like, oh my gosh, if I think every single person on this entire planet needs to hear this right now, because as we all know, the mental health in our world and our lives because of COVID has sunk tremendously. I think we're all at this point of just grasping at straws for any kind of um, even just normalcy or getting back to just routines that we've had in the past. And she sent me a text and she's like, it's, I just feel so disconnected from everyone. She's like, we're just surviving, doing the best that we can. And she's like, survival mode just isn't working for me anymore. She's like, I'm just, I'm done with it. And I'm like, oh, sister, you hit the nail on the head. And even though she is a very intuitive eater, I know a lot of my clients and a lot of my followers, a lot of people who listen to this podcast can relate to that, to where you just feel underwater so much. And you keep saying, okay, next week's going to be better. Next month's going to be better. Even next year is going to be better. And we still feel just this overwhelm, this intense anxiety and this stress. And a lot of it leads to stress eating or eating for anxiety um, and just unconscious eating, as I like to call it. But it all falls under the umbrella of emotional eating. So my friend doesn't experience this anymore. She's definitely worked on her relationship with food and she is incredible. But to the people who are stuck in this mode of, I don't know why I feel the need to just have not only a cookie or a brownie, but I feel like I have to have this entire pan, this entire stack of cookies. Like it's just this form of eating to where we don't even know why we're eating, but we're just putting food in our mouths and we're like, what in the hell is going on? So I want to chat about this. I want to talk about the origins of where this is coming from because this is probably freaking you out and you're probably just like, Christy, fix it. Help it. Help it. Get it out of here because it's so frustrating. It is one of those things to where you're like, I'm I'm fine. Like I'm not even dieting now or maybe you are or maybe you're stuck in a place that you're, you're unsure of what to do. Maybe you're currently dieting or currently working on your relationship with food and you're just like, I don't know how to do this. But we've got to think about too the origins of emotional eating because you know me, I'm not just a surface level person. I'm not going to give you some Mickey Mouse bullshit here about just go for a walk and you're going to be fine. (laughs) It goes so much deeper than that. Not dissing on walks at all. But I know back in the day, you know, reading all these articles, it was like, take a spa. Like, oh my gosh, this is giving me more anxiety because I don't even have time to do that. Like if I could have time to take a bath, don't you think I would? So I would get angry because I'm like, something's wrong with me. Why can I not do this? I see so many people doing this, but I don't understand why this is so hard for me. So I figured some things out. I did some delayering and I started recognizing the origins that, you know, it's great for for in the moment times. It, it is great to go for a walk. It is great to kind of decompress with a bath and things like that. But what's really happening inside is something that I just want you to be aware of because the origins that this is coming from is likely, you know, how we grew up media, social media, which is crazy, crazy now. And when I'm talking about that, I'm talking about when you feel like you're a woman or a person, a man, anybody in this world that's just trying to survive, you're basically on stress mode at all times. You're at this point where you feel like your eyeballs are just above water and your nose is barely grasping for air like every couple seconds. And you're just like, I I feel like I'm living this way and I am just, I'm exhausted 
from living in survival mode because survival mode is high anxiety. Survival mode for us is like running from a tiger. Survival mode from us is is that very high stress, blood pressure rising, face getting red, getting warm, sweating hot, you know, all those types of feelings and all the physical aspects that ooze out of our body because of it. This comes from the feeling of, man, I need to do it all. I am not enough right now, so I need to be enough. And when it comes to food, this is where we get stuck because this is likely a learned cue for emotional eating. And especially it starts from a very, very young age. Remember when, you know, we were told, okay, be good. And we're going to go get ice cream after this. Or if you go potty like a big girl, I'll get you some M&Ms. The power that food has over us to feel like we've accomplished something or that we're being good or rewarded is just this innate sense that has been instilled into us from childhood. So this is why as adults, when we feel like we need a treat, when we feel like we're in this survival mode, we need a break from running from that, we go to that one thing that we've always went to before which is food, which is I need to feel like a good person. I need to feel like I'm doing something right. And this can lead to food for a lot of us. And what we've talked about with a lot of my clients is that it's not necessarily the food that we crave, but it's the experience that we create that we crave. We're craving an experience of hiding away in a tree so that the tiger doesn't see us, hoping it's going to go away. And I'm a huge metaphor person, so the tiger is your problems, your issues, your struggles, right? Not having enough time, not having enough money, not being enough, not being enough for yourself, for your family, for everything else, everyone else in this world. It's kind of that old adage of, you know, we feel like we have to be everything for everyone especially and I'm going to hone in on women especially as women and even men you know men have a stigma of always having to be the the sturdy can't show emotion type people so we each have our our own corners that we kind of dive into and some people feel both on those ends so this is a very 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 deep rooted issue In our world, in our culture, whether it's, you know, celebrating an engagement or, hey, I haven't seen you in a while or, hey, we're COVID negative, that's great, or we have a wedding or job offer, promotion, new baby, like anything that we have that's a life altering moment, it gives us a a sense of accomplishment. And what do people do when we have that? Let's go out to dinner. Oh, hey, or even if you're going through a tough time, I brought you some lasagna. I brought you some comfort food. I brought you some friendship. Like this is sometimes people's way of saying, I love you. And it's their way of letting you know that they care about you. And I don't necessarily think that that's a wrong thing, but a lot of times we look to food to give us a celebration when our life can seem like it's anything but a celebration. And this kind of leads to that whole sense of overeating, of again, getting to that experience that we want. We want that experience of a celebration. We've been stuck in COVID mode for the past two years, hoping to God this year isn't the same. And we're just like hoping and praying like, please, 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 2022, don't be. Or as a way to deal with these unattended to emotions of guilt, of shame, of not feeling And whenever you're having those feelings of low self-worth, low self-image, of you never being or doing or having enough, guilt and shame are likely riding shotgun in that same car that is driving you into just burnout or complete just an emotional breakdown. So I really want you to start thinking about how guilt and shame really have no value in this world, how maybe we're looking at it the wrong way, right? Maybe instead of thinking that, oh my gosh, I I totally let go of myself. I've totally released everything, every point of discipline, every point of perseverance that I had on, on my plan. I was doing so well and I just, I let it all go. I fell off the wagon. Instead of thinking in for frameworks like that, why don't we start looking at the framework itself? Like meaning, yeah, sometimes I get it. Like if you just came off of the holidays and you're like, oh, I just want to get back to my routine of my salads and, and, you know, having beers on the weekends and eating 
for performance and for enjoyment. Yeah, I totally get that, you know, to where you just want to eat balanced. You want to get back to your workout routine and not in a in an obsessive way. But I can also understand where if you're if you've been doing this hardcore burnout workout, like working out five days a week, you know, two hours a day, an hour to two hours a day, and maybe you're eating super clean and then you're just like, oh my gosh, I couldn't, I fell off the wagon. Well, maybe it wasn't you. Maybe it was your process. Maybe it was your framework that failed you. Maybe it was an unsustainable plan. So I really want you to start thinking about the fact that you don't have to be and do it all in this world, that your value does not come from the shape of your body. And yes, we 100% need to take care of our bodies. We have to be at that place where we're taking care of our bodies so we can be with our families for a long time, so we can walk up the stairs without feeling winded, so we can go play with our kids, nieces and nephews, family and friends, uh, run outside and not feel like we're not able to keep up or sit in a swing set or anything like that. We 100% have to take care of ourselves. But I think we do it in such a strenuous way that it brings on stress and anxiety that's unneeded and frankly unnecessary. So you don't need to go on keto to be healthy. You don't need to be paleo or have a strict macro macro plan if you start becoming obsessive around food. Uh, For some of us, it just doesn't work that way. So a lot of times I take that and think about, wow, this is how we treat life. Like, Like my friend Elena was saying, we're just so underwater all the time we're just in survival and when we start living in survival mode like I mean living in it this has now become our basis of living is now our our body just naturally regulates to that high intensity high impact day of stress and anxiety because we've been doing it for so long that now it's just our body's routine it starts to begin living in our sympathetic nervous system which is our fight flight or freeze so basically, you're living your entire life in, oh my gosh, you do this, oh, do that. And if you're a fight, flight, or freeze person, then you're likely um, kind of like following these paths with eating as well. So for example, if you're a fight person, then you might fight back with dieting a lot. If you're a flight person, you might uh, just run away from it all and numb out with food. Or if you're a freeze person, which I've noticed I am, I just get paralyzed by the whole thing and I just freeze. I just stand there and I completely just zone out. And likely I'll zone out with something with the exact opposite feeling, which is comfort, comfort food, needing to feel good again, needing to feel celebrated again. So it's all just this really big, vicious. Now, I do have to preface this is that It is okay sometimes to use food as a coping mechanism. Food is one of many coping mechanisms that we can do. So I'm going to tell you right now that there's times when I still use food as a way of dealing with something. But I will say that now I, when I do it, I understand and I actually tell myself, and I will say this out loud, Christy, you are eating out of emotion. You are eating because you're bored. You are eating because you're stressed. And literally by saying it out loud, it takes the power away from it. Because our fears and our insecurities love the dark. They hate the spotlight. And when they're found out, when they're out on front stage there, they despise it and they shrink. But they grow in the dark which is where secret eating comes from. Um, I have clients, you know, and I did this as well, where when people would walk out of the room, you would kind of just eat the scraps that were of the cupcakes and the frosting that were left on people's plates. Or even when you would take a wrapper from a candy bar or something and you would shove it underneath the the trash so that nobody would see it because you're like oh my gosh I just ate dinner they can't know that I just had this cliff bar the Snickers bar whatever it is so by bringing that out into the spotlight what you're doing is you're actually fighting it you're actually correcting and bringing your fears out in the open which can be scary but it is very necessary so if you have to use food as a way to cope it's okay But when it becomes your only way to cope or your only way to deal with things, that's when it becomes an issue or a problem. So like we talked about before, 
what we're looking for with emotional eating is an experience. And when I talk about stress eating and when I talk about boredom eating, it's the same thing. With boredom, we're likely looking for the opposite experience. So even with boredom eating, it falls under the umbrella of emotional eating. So when we boredom eat, we're looking for an experience to be doing something. And when we physically perform the act of chewing, it actually kind of like numbs our brain out for a little bit so it can focus on the chewing and then sends it down to digest in our body. It also sends us a dopamine hit, which gives us that feel good hormone. So likely if we're not feeling good or if we're kind of just like, yeah, I'm bored, I need to feel like I'm being productive, that dopamine hit, that very small dopamine hit that comes and goes very quickly because we're gonna have to do it again and again and again, uh, it, it will come to us, but it will make us feel like we're being productive or fixing the boredom. Same thing with stress or anxiety. What we're doing is likely numbing it out. We're trying to suppress it because we don't wanna feel stressed. And this can be in the fight or the freeze mode to where we're just like, okay, I need to stop thinking about this problem, even though it's still gonna be there when I'm done eating and feeling like crap afterward because I'm eating way too much. I don't know what to do right now, so I'm just gonna eat this because I want to. And I don't know what else to do. I don't know how to fix this. I don't know how to do this or deal with this. And so that's what happens there. And then what's involved with emotional eating is we're trying to experience uh, usually what that food, what we're hoping that food will give us. So a lot of times when emotional eating happens, it's because we're trying to deal with a problem, but we're using the wrong tool to attend to it. So it's kind of like when you're using a screwdriver to help you dig out your planting beds for gardening. (laughs) It just doesn't work that way. So what this does with emotional eating is I really want you to start thinking about what am I hoping this food is going to fix for me? A lot of times when I dive into this, a lot of times when I think about it for myself, because it's still like I still think about it. Oh, I should just finish this off. It's right here. The kids left like a half a bag of M&Ms. I'm just going to eat them. And then I'm like, whoa, Christy, what's what's going on here? Because I always tell myself I'm allowed to have anything, but I, I want to make sure that I'm actually wanting it and that I'm actually hungry for it. And so if I'm not actually wanting it or just trying to eat it because it's there, what am I trying to to fix? And a lot of times you have to understand I have ADD. I am have a lot of trouble organizing myself if I don't follow my planner. So for me, it's creating order. If I'm finishing that half of a bag of M&Ms, what that's doing is it's creating order. I'm actually doing something and then finish, finishing something, which is a big problem for me in my family life. In my business life, I'm extremely organized with my clients, but in my family life, my husband's like, Christy, one thing at a time. And it's it's really frustrating for him and for me as well. So in my family life, you know, thing a laundry will be out and I'll be halfway through that and then I'll be doing the dishes and oh, don't forget, I should probably clean the floors and oh, let me go into the, the closet. I should probably clean out the closet and now everything's open and there's stuff everywhere and I'm just like, ooh, sorry. <laughs> the ADD hit a little hard. But what I'm trying to do in my brain is to create order. And so to me, by finishing that one task of even eating half of the bag of M&Ms, even though I don't want it, that's what I'm trying to do is clean up, get rid of things. So there's a lot of different ways you can look at this based on who you are, based on what you're going through, based on the traumatic experiences you've been through, or based on even some of the stressors that are going on in life. And don't forget, likely if you're having stress at home or um, maybe you're having stress at work or anxiety at work, maybe you're super collected at work. Like me, I'm super, super structured with my clients. But when it comes to myself, my family, I am such a just let it fly, let it go. Likely when we're high up with organization in one area of our lives, when we have a big control over that, we likely let go of something else in the other areas of our lives. It could be in relationships, with money, with your self-development, with health. So I explain this a lot to my clients like you're juggling, right? Let's say you have six balls. Um, Likely you can only juggle like comfortably three balls at a time. So you have three balls on the floor. Lots of ball talk right now. So bear with me. So you're going to have to, I mean, this is what balancing is. Balancing isn't trying to figure out how to get all six up in the air at one time, because that leads to burnout. That's when we start that crazy two hour a day, seven day a week workout program with our 1200 calorie diet while we meditate for 12 hours a day and make sure we read every day and make sure we, um, get that project done and make sure we get the house painted and everything in one week, you know, we're we're just at the point of burnout. It's just too.
So the whole point of balancing is to notice, okay, I have these three balls up in there. Maybe it's I'm working on my career, I'm working on uh, my intuitive eating for nutrition, and I'm working on my self-development. You might notice that down on the floor, maybe family life is down there. Maybe your financial life is down there. You know, maybe um, another aspect of your life is down there. So what balance really is, is making sure that we're getting those balls into rotation and that when one ball has been on the floor too long, that we get it back into rotation. So that's really what balance is. It's noticing we've gone just a little bit too far to this side and just going back over to this side. We might float towards the middle a little bit, go over to the other side, and then notice we're too far on that side. So that's really what balance is. I don't want you to think of balance as this tiny little pinpoint point right in the center we've got it and if we don't stay it just creates another extreme between the black and the white and we have to be on this exact point if we really want to be balanced so i want you to start especially with emotional eating giving yourself that grace like knowing that you're doing the best that you can right now and that when you're adding something on like self-development or working to heal your relationship with food something is naturally going to have to fall off right it's the law of addition when you add something something's naturally going to have to come off your plate pun intended so i want you to start thinking about it that way and some specific feelings that i want to touch on that are being involved with emotional eating. And this is has a lot to do with uh, Evelyn Triboli and Elise Resch's book, The Intuitive Eating Book. But they talk about this, how there are specific fe- feelings involved that you're trying to fix, suppress, avoid, or use while emotional eating. And coping is one of them. So this is the classic, like, I'm not hungry, but I saw a pizza ad and now I'm hungry. And... If you find that you eat a lot when you're truly not hungry, you're probably gonna find that you're trying to cope with something or you may be kind of swayed by your environment a little bit. So if you ever overeat and tell yourself that you're just eating it because it tastes good, I want you to ask yourself if that's the real truth. Because when we think about, oh, I'm just hungry, that's a type of hunger, that's a biological hunger. But if you're like, oh, I'm not hungry, but I just want a taste of something, that's an actual type of hunger too. That's one of your four types of hunger. But a taste hunger doesn't, you don't need a lot of food there. You just need a taste of it. So when you keep eating it, I want you to ask yourself, okay, what else is really going on? Because sometimes even when I'm like keep eating something, I notice it's usually at night. It's usually when I'm the most stressed. It's usually at that point in time when the kids are running around, you know, just had a full day of work. And even though I absolutely love what I do, I get to that point to where I'm just kind of like, I'm mentally exhausted. I'm tired. I give everything to my clients and I want to make sure that I'm not completely burnt out for my kids. And there has been times when I will get to them and just be like, oh my gosh, it's giving me everything I could take just to give you a bath. And while they're in the bath, my husband's watching them and I'll, I'll run over to the kitchen and I'll just, I used to like shove candy in my mouth. I used to just shove chocolate, anything that was left over. I grab the leftover frosting can and just finish it off because that was my time to really numb out from all of the stressors, all of life's craziness of being a mom, of trying to be everything. And that was the only way I felt I could deal with it until I actually dove deep into the real problem. It was my insecurity around being a mom. My biggest insecurity in life right now isn't food. It's it's being a mom. So many people have told me how I'm doing it wrong or have sent slight, slighted comments about how I do things. And being a person, <laughs> not a robot, I'm affected by it of, oh my gosh, what if they think I'm a bad mom? And and when you're a mom, being a bad mom is, is kind of like the worst thing in the world to you. And it's kind of like in the dieting world. If you're dieting, gaining weight is the worst thing in the world to you. When really the truth about momming and parenting in general is that none of us have a fucking clue what we're doing. We're all just like throwing shit at the wall and hoping that it sticks. And it's the same, same thing with dieting. Like you're you're never going to be perfect. If you want to live in a bubble, you can to where you never grow out. You only eat the same thing every day. You never have alcohol. You only do things this way. You work out this many times a week and that's it. That's your life. I've lived that life. And I absolutely hated it because you think you're going to be sexy and beautiful, but you have no energy to be sexy. You have no like feelings at all to be beautiful because you're just so exhausted from, from just complete nutrition burnout. <laughs> Hello, name of this podcast. So there's also 
boredom and procrastination eating. So maybe you have something to do and you really don't want to do it. So it's kind of like when you are like, okay, I know I've got to clean out the kitchen. I have to clean out the refrigerator. It's disgusting. And then all of a sudden you open up the coat closet and you're like, well, this probably should get organized really quick. And you're just avoiding things, right? So a lot of times we can use food as that that method too. Um, and as busy people, we're so on the go that a couple of minutes of downtime makes us feel like we should be doing something productive. So we eat instead. So that could be another thing that happens. So bribery and reward can also be an emotion of emotional eating and fall under the emotional eating umbrella like we talked about before. Um, You know, needing to feel good about ourselves. You know, if I clean my room, I can have that treat. So we can often reward ourselves with food, even though we're not hungry for it and we really don't want it. But this is the only time I can get it and I'll just start again tomorrow. So, you know, I'll eat it all tonight and I'll probably just eat the whole thing so it's not in my kitchen anymore. And then that way I'll just start over again on Monday. But really, it's only... Thursday. So you're just like, okay, great. So oftentimes too, we can eat to soothe. So it can be really appealing to go get an ice cream sandwich rather than dealing with that hard talk that you know you have to have with a family member or somebody. Especially when, you know, comfort food takes you back to that nostalgic place when life was easier. And, you know, maybe you fell down on the playground and your parents or somebody was like, come on, I think ice cream will make it better. And you're like, yeah, well, you're right, you're right. And this is all kind of just nailed into us. It's very deeply rooted within this. And this is a way to bring sweetness into our lives. You know what I mean? Like, oh, I need something sweet to feel sweet. And this can also be something to think about when you're feeling different emotions. I ask my clients all the time, like, okay, well, you were angry when you were eating, so tell me what you ate. And likely it's something that's sweet or crunchy. If it's something sweet, it's likely because they're like, oh my gosh, I needed to have that sweetness in my life. Something that that felt good and something that just tasted sweet and not bitter. And a lot of times too, if somebody's angry, they're wanting something crunchy because it's something that they can actually relieve stress from. Think about actual, that physical act of chewing and crunching down takes force, right? So there's that too. And like we talk about, that comes from frustration, anger, rage. So many emotions on this spectrum can cause binge eating. So on the opposite end of love, the physical act of biting and chomping and crunching can serve as a way to release tension or like crack our food. So stress is another one. Stress can turn your appeal to eat on or off. So blood sugar gets elevated. Uh, Likely we just skip lunch because we're so busy at work and our digestion gets slowed down when stress occurs in the body. And then all of a sudden, the biological reactions to stress get in our bodies for fight or flight mode, right? That sympathetic nervous system and You know, back in the day, it was so great when we faced the dangers of that saber-toothed tiger, but we don't have those same stressors anymore. Our stress now comes from emotional needs not being what met in our world of abundance. Our cortisol can rise and our blood sugar spikes, which causes an increase in our stress levels. And even if we aren't stress eaters, the undereating because we hadn't had lunch, because we're too busy, can cause overeating when our body's ready to finally catch up. So, and also dieting can be a form of stress. So think about it that way. And when we talk about anxiety or depression, this is also a definite, definite, definite emotion on the scale here of of emotional and stress eating. This can bring on a super urgent need to eat. So remember that biological hunger, true hunger is gradual. It is not sudden. So all of a sudden, if you're like, I am 100% starving when five minutes ago you were like, meh, I could or couldn't eat. I'm okay. That is a sign of stress or something triggering, something in your environment triggering an emotional or, um, you know, experience under the emotional eating umbrella. So anxiety is usually present in that future thinking, right? So if we're worried about something in the future, it hasn't happened yet, and we're we're trying to figure it out in our heads, and this can be involved with kids, money, careers, family, health, time, relationship issues. Those are some of the biggest factors we have in 
and depression usually happens after the anxiety. We usually get so worked up from the anxiety that our body naturally has to come down and our body is so focused on balancing itself out that it's not going to go straight to the balance. It's actually going to go to the exact opposite emotion of anxiety, which is usually depression. And when I say opposite, I mean, it's going to have like almost like that, that drug effect, like if you're taking an upper, (laughs) right? And all of a sudden you just hit that crashing point and you just like die down or it's like a sugar crash or something like that to where you're just like coming down from it. That is likely a form of depression. Um, So depression usually happens digging through old hurtful memories of pain, you know, reliving something because you feel like you deserve to relive that emotion because you're not good, good enough or you're shameful or you're hurt by it. But what really happens is it's only going to fuel the fire for that numbing agent, which is food. So you might find that you eat more during your seasons of depression. And another reason why we binge eat or overeat, emotional eat or stress eat is because we want to feel connected. So remember, we celebrate with food as a society. So by eating, you're almost kind of celebrating. So it can act as a cure for loneliness, but it's a pseudo cure. So your first assignment is to really start noticing what emotions are happening below the surface of this emotional, anxiety, stressful, numbing, eating experience that you're having. Okay, you first have to understand that this isn't really about the food. It's about our underlying issues that we're putting a band-aid over with food, right? It's like putting a band-aid over a bullet hole wound. What we're doing is we think we're fixing the problem, but really we're we're actually just making it worse. We're fixing the problem in a short-term solution, not a long-term solution. So what do you do after that? This is what I tell my clients. This is where you sit in your shit. So sitting in your shit, this can be a period of time when you mourn the loss of using food as a coping mechanism. It can be mourning the loss of a leaner body. It can feel like, super terrible, like almost like losing a friend who was always there for you, but it's extremely toxic. So we now have to find new ways of coping and we can sometimes get really angry for not having those comforting coping mechanisms anymore. But this, what it's going to do by sitting in your shit and actually dealing with what's going on instead of using food as the band-aid, this is going to force you to deal with your problems head on. Overeating is a sign that you have stress, anxiety, something, some kind of emotional need that's not being attended to somewhere in your life. Remember, your triggers are your messengers. Your relationship with food will become more positive when you can stop using food as a weapon and start using it as an ally. So instead of running from it or using food to soothe these feelings, try to take these feelings head on and get to what's really bothering you? Are you lonely? Are you feeling super uncomfortable because you have to have a conversation with someone that you don't have, you don't want to? Are you feeling shameful or guilty because of the way you look or because of the way someone looked at you or because of something someone said to you at work or because of something, shoot, maybe it could be because somebody cut you off on the freeway. I don't know what it is, but I wanted to give you like, okay, something to think about. Because this is what I tell my clients. This is kind of like a little blurb I wrote that can give you a sense of what sitting in your shit sounds like. So this is literally me working through one of my problems. And I wrote it down uh, years and years ago and actually put it in one of my trainings here, uh, one of my lessons in my Courageous Nourisher course. So this is how sitting in your shit sounds. Yes, Christy, you have gained weight uncomfortably sitting. But the size of your body is the least interesting thing about you. Still uncomfortable, but you have my attention. Yes, Christy, you do need to retire those workout pants because they are way too snug around your waist and they only make you feel more insecure by wearing them. True, still uncomfy, but kind of intrigued now. Yes, you need to eat that cinnamon roll because you can't stop thinking about it. Oh, I do want to eat it because I've been thinking about it for days. Oh my gosh. And then this restriction telling myself that I can't have it is only making it worse. And I don't even have to eat the whole thing. I can just have a bite, right? Yes, (laughs) absolutely. And yes, you do need to buy a bigger size in those pants because you're not that small anymore. That hurts, but it's a truthful hurt. 
I need to hear it because my body isn't my everything. Go on. This doesn't change how good of a mother, a wife, a person, a daughter, a coach, a nutritionist you are. Society can shove its standards up its size zero ass. I've got more important things to do than worry about pleasing others with the shape of my body. Hell yeah. Let's do this. So that was literally me sitting in my shit. And honestly, sometimes it won't go like that. Sometimes you're going to be like, but but I want to have those pants. I really want to be in those pants. And then you have to kind of be like a kid asking why the sky is blue. But why? But why? But why? How did you like living that lifestyle of constantly having to bring your food everywhere? Of not being able to have a beer out with your husband at night, even though you really wanted to? Well, I hated it. Okay. What do you want? What don't you want? That's something that you have to know. And that's something that you really have to sit in your shit about and figure out. And the most important thing to do right now is to figure out what kind of lifestyle you want to have and then build your health around that. I want to have the kind of lifestyle where I'm able to go out and have a beer with my husband and I'm able to go out and go play tennis and I'm able to go out and go on vacation without having to work up a body before I go on vacation, without having to save up points or calories or anything like that so I could have one beer or one glass of wine at dinner or a dinner roll or anything like that. You know, I want to have that life where I eat healthy, but I am not scared to get the spaghetti if I want it because I know how to eat that spaghetti without binging on it and I know what amounts feel good to me that's the kind of lifestyle I want to live so what does that have to do with my body shape right I'm still healthy I'm still going out and enjoying my life so this is that where we get stuck that place of I want this body but I also want this fun living lifestyle so you have to understand that there is a cost to leanness so what cost are you willing to pay my friends this has been a very deep, deep dive into emotional eating, stress eating, anxiety eating. So I really, really hope this helped you. And as always, if you liked this episode, if this episode helped you, please share it with a friend. Um, It would mean the absolute world to me if you could give this podcast episode a five-star review, leave a comment below. And what this will do is it will actually help more people hear this podcast. And some things I want you to look out for. So (laughs) intuitively strong is growing leaps and bounds. Like I am, I'm freaking out because we're just, we're booming right now in all areas. And the first thing that we're doing is we've created our own app. I say we, it's, it's me, but I've created my own app, but I say we, because this is a community and I would not be here without you. So we are getting an app and you're invited. It's going to be launched very soon, probably in February and I want you to get on my Sunday Scaries weekly email series because what that's going to do is that's going to let you know when the app releases. And there's actually a free, completely 100% free Beat the Binge Masterclass training on there that is going to be incredible. And I want you to have that resource. And the first launch of the year for my Courageous Nourisher Academy has skyrocketed already. The women that are involved are already killing it and crushing it. And it's only week two. I just had a client tell me that she's like, I just bought a cake from the bakery that I could never, ever keep in the house. And she's like, I ended up just throwing it away because she's like, I I haven't been like hungry for it. I forgot about it. She's like, it went stale. I had to throw it away. And I'm like, this is what it's all about. It's about neutralizing food and creating abundance around it with my strategies and my my systems that I help you put into place to trust yourself around food again. So make sure you click the show notes below because I have a waiting list for my next round that's launching in March. And you're going to get VIP access along with a sweet discount through my VIP lounge. All right, my friends, that is all I have for you today. And until next time, stay courageous and stay nourished. Intuitively strong out.